So I want to start with um, uh, some influences. As far as scientific explanations are concerned, that is, not influences for any data visualization, my sort of data visualization, or, um, or maps, for instance. And a key uh, influence on me was Fritz Kahn, who I'm sure you all know, who did wonderful things in the 1930s, m mostly accurate. Uh, he drew pictures because he was talking to regular people, not to members of academia, and that's something that I have spent my whole life doing. He did very, some very simple things and some fairly complicated. This is a, the mouth of a three-year-old. Uh, wonderful thing to see now, uh, let alone in 1930 or thereabouts when he did this. Second influence, which has uh, carried me through for a, a, a lot of my work, is a particular kind of British humor, which I first learned about from Edward Lear and his wonderful nonsense lyrics and uh, limericks and, and uh, other poems. And a uh, show in England, anybody heard of The Goon Show? Um, they were so ridiculously funny that when I actually had my appendix out, I had to tell the hospital, which was the Royal Infirmary in Hull in Yorkshire, uh, to take off my um, earphones because uh, it hurt so much uh, laughing at these, these three people. If you can recognize the guy on the, on the far side there, that's Peter Sellers who went on to a different kind of fame. And then following them, um, Monty Python and, and everything that John Cleese and, and they did. And I realized when I was putting this together that uh, all these three, uh, together with you know, Dada and other uh, art movements, um, I realized that, that nonsense is probably not the best influence as a model for somebody who's trying to design explanations. But what I actually mean about humor is that I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about actually the things that really make you laugh although I grew up with that, and I like to laugh. It's more like good humor, uh, about being friendly, about being human. So I've always tried to include a human figure in the things that I've done, assuming that there are figures to be put in there. And so I started uh, work in, in England, uh, a lot of work for the, for the BBC. This was a book. Uh, called The Ascent of Man by Jacob Bronowski. And it's a kind of a mild self-portrait. Uh, I can't think for the life of me now why I used this particularly um, uh, exotic uh, typeface. But, um, oh, and this doesn't work, okay. Um, but uh, he, here, this, this, this type. It would have been better if it had been plainer, but I, I was younger then. Um, <clears throat> when I came to um, America, I continued to try to humanize things and got into quite a lot of trouble with some people in academia who didn't like the sort of stuff that I was doing. And in particular, the, the man who I was working with on this, whose life's work it was to explain interferon, um, was horrified when uh, we told him that we were going that this is what we were going to do, I told him. And he said, um, can you do something else? Can you do something that's kind of plainer? And, uh, and I said, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm just calling you out of courtesy. We're actually going to do this. And, uh, um, and so uh, he, he kind of slammed the phone down. And, um, and then I got a letter from him, a very nice letter, about a week later when he said, a whole lot of my colleagues have just said, well, now I see what you're doing. And that was an, uh, you know, a, nice, a nice feeling for me. Uh, but anyway, 
Uh, so this is a, a drafty house for the New York Times, 1978, from when there was a home section in the New York Times. And this is mu much more recent. This is from a book of mine um, <coughs> about travel, in case you have to do an emergency tracheotomy. Um, and it's, a, it's pretty horrific. horrific. I've, I've done a f quite a few medical things, and in some cases I have to kind of stop working and go and throw up. Um, but all of these things that I'm showing you are for the general reader, as, as I said before. So I'm trying to kind of make it pictorial in a way that's both accurate but also uh, friendly. So let's look at three uh, explanatory diagrams in, in, in a little bit more detail. So this one is about stress. So this, this is the piece that, that, uh, that ran, but we're going to go through it uh, in, in, in some detail. Um, and, and this was uh, 1983. Uh, and uh, it's 1983, so I wouldn't necessarily do it like this now. Uh, but I thought you might like to see what happens. I start quite often with some sort of drawing that make to think about some way to frame the whole thing. And I wanted this all to be in the person's head and body. Uh, so, you know, is he actually stressed or is he thinking? I'm, I'm not sure that I was really thinking clearly though and I don't want to put thoughts into Rodin's mind. But anyway, uh, pretty soon I'll actually attempt a complete sketch with, and this is very important, with my attempt at what the text is going to be. Because I've always thought that this sort of explanatory diagram is a marriage of words and pictures. And increasingly, as I've been continued to work, I found that the words actually come first, much so I wouldn't have drawn uh, the Rodin figure. I would have uh, started with the text completely by itself. Uh, and so the text here is written out in, in my hand, what I think it should say, as, as I understand it from the reading that I've done prior to, to doing this. Uh, and if I can't say something in words, then, I, Personally, I find that I'm probably not understanding it. Uh, I'm, not I'm not understanding the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show. Uh, the next stage is to show a version of this to the science editor, so, and then the top editor of Time magazine. And so I'll do a sketch which shows enough of what the idea is, and I'll talk through uh, what the text is going to say. So I just put down some dummy text there, which is actually the typeface that's going to be used eventually, uh, so that I can begin to see how, 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 much, how many words there are. And uh, what this is, by the way, is just a, a uh, kind of wash of markers behind uh, a piece of tracing paper with the drawing on top and then the, the type stuck up on, on the top of that. Uh, and then I will, um, the type will go and be set, what I've written will go and be set into a, into a long galley, and I will trace out the beginning and the end, you know, with a piece of uh, text underneath it, underneath a piece of tracing paper, the beginning word and the end word, so that I can then see where the line breaks will come, and I can send that back to the typesetter. This was all pre-computer. I mean, this is, you know, 1983. Oh, or pre-computer at time, anyway. Um, and um, the uh, and I'll begin to refine the drawing a little bit. And then the type is set according to my line breaks, and my researchers, who I've worked with, obviously to get to this stage, uh, will uh, correct it. And there weren't too many corrections, actually, on this one. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, this is what James Joyce did for, the, for a galley proof of Ulysses, in which he is actually writing complete new sentences on top of a, a, a galley. 
And I'll really then tighten up the drawing in pencil. And these are complicated things to draw in pencil. I mean, uh, a train that is curved like that. Uh, and uh, the, the little marks that you see on here, these little marks, actually refer to the piece of plastic that I'm going to use when I finally draw this, this thing. And th this is what it is. Um, this is a, a German thing called a standard graph, which has all sorts of wonderful curves on it that you can draw curves that back onto each other. Because finally, I'm going to have to do a drawing that, that's going to be printed from. So this is the drawing that, that it was printed from. And if you're interested, I actually bought it along. So if you want to see it later, you can see the drawing that, um, that I did. That, that this is uh, uh, actually a rather bad scan of. It's actually much nicer than that. So come and have a look at that if you would like afterwards or in the break. Uh, and so the, 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 the final drawing, the final piece is like this. And looking back at it now, um, I think that what I should have done was to put the little numbers in red in, in the text there. And maybe that text is a little bit too dense there, and I was designing rather than thinking about the reader a little bit too much, I think, here. I mean, that's a criticism that I can say from what, nearly 40 years uh, back. Uh, I was preparing this on National Stress Day, which is November the 2nd this year, and I thought, oh, well, maybe Rodin's thinker was actually stressed. So the second thing we're going to talk about is stem cells. This was for Stanford Magazine, and this is a much, much later piece. Um, and the first things that I do um, is to uh, this is the equivalent of the first drawing that I showed you for the other piece, the stress. And I have a series of notebooks that I carry around. And uh, anything that I'm working on go goes into these notebooks. Um, and, uh, and I keep them. I'm currently on number 63. Uh, and uh, I think this was like number 12 or something uh, when I did this in 2003. <coughs> Um, and they're very useful to look back for, to, to, to look back at, because they can see, I can see my own thinking. And this drawing did not turn out like this at all. And it didn't really, it started to turn out like that. And this, this, is what, this is what I first gave to Stanford University. And uh, there was a problem with this bit. Uh, the blast, you know more about this than I do, I'm sure, scientists. I'm, I'm simply trying to explain it to people. I have to try to find out about it. But I put big question mark here with two figures in it, two people. Scientists generally agree that the blastocyst can be considered an early stage embryo. OK, here's another run-in with a scientist at Stanford who said he would withdraw his article from the, from the magazine if this ran because he felt so strongly that this should never happen, as it is says. But the picture was there that he just didn't want to have anything to do with it. So this is, I missed one. Uh, there's one missing, which is, uh, the way it ran, which was basically like this, but, but, but without this. I mean, if ever I learned that a picture is worth a thousand words, this, this was it. And I had, as you just saw, I had learned about the power of pictures with a map that I proposed for time, but you'll be glad to know that it did not run uh, because of a lot of uh, antagonism from my fellow workers. Uh, I thought it was actually quite a clever idea. This is uh, from 1989. Um, so the states would be colored differently now. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is the Higgs boson. 
And this was a job for the New York Times a couple of years ago uh, with a wonderful script by Jonathan Corum, whose work you will see most Tuesdays in the, in the New York Times. And uh, although it was Steve Dwenis, the, the then graphics director, now he's actually on the masthead of the New York Times as an assistant editor. Uh, they wanted to explain the Higgs boson. Uh, it's wonderful talking, by the way, to a group like this because you know what all these things are, so I don't have to say very much. Um, but <coughs> uh, what Steve wanted as the art director, as it were, was a, a kind of a light drawing that was not crisp and tight and sciency, because they weren't sure what they were talking about all the time. Uh, so I was the kind of foil that allowed a little leeway here and there in their thinking. And uh, you know, Einstein was involved in this, so I said to him, "So you know, you want a funny little drawing like this?" And he said. No, no, not like that at all. I want it more like kind of drawn by hand. So I said, OK. Um, you, you know, like this. And he said, well, not even like that, really. You know, he had seen drawings like this that I do almost weekly in jazz clubs in New York, where I go and I just sit and draw the people. This is Kurt Rosenwinkel at uh, the Village Vanguard in 2012. And uh, here's Rudresh Mahanthapa um, at uh, the Jazz Standard. Great, great place. Nice food, too. And he said, this is the kind of drawing that I want. Real drawing of, of real things. So the overall metaphor for this thing that he had chosen wasn't my choice not that it was a bad choice, was uh, a field of snow to describe what happens in the Higgs boson story. Uh, so these little sketches down the side were what I thought I was going to draw in, my, in a simplified style, but he had warned me away from that. So I went out into my own garden <laughs> where it had been snowing at that time and just started to draw some things, some trees in the garden and some uh, snow field. And a uh, skier, and another skier, and these were going to be the markers for the various parts of the story. Electrons, quarks, W and Z bosons, and muons and gluons. You'll see later how this, how this works. So it's OK to draw this kind of thing as though I was sitting in the jazz club drawing something right in front of me. But muons and gluons, when I came to have to make them into a, some sort of a diagram, were different. So you know, again, I said, well, you know, at, to a certain state, at, at a certain point, we're going to have to actually just address the Higgs, the muons, the gluons, the W and Z boson. They said, no, no. Actually, I think we could just get over that by just making them all into a kind of ball that's kind of rattling around. And we'll do a little bit of light animation. I said, f f lovely. I, I don't do animation, but if you'd like to do that, then great. So uh, this, was the, this was the print version. There were actually two pages of it in which they introduce what the Higgs is. There were other metaphors. Like, it's, the field has been called a kind of cosmic molasses, or it's like uh, a room full of paparazzi, or it's been likened to the force in Star Wars. But we'll use a field of snow. And so you can see them all there. And then uh, along with that, they did a version for the web, uh, which is like this.
I point you to Alicia DeSantis, Jacqueline, and Josh, uh, who did a wonderful job with animation, I think. Um, and uh, this, this won an award, and I was most insistent that Jonathan and those other people that I mentioned should really get the award because I was just their wrist, in a sense. Um, and uh, they, they really um, did a beautiful thing. Uh, but I used a lot of pencil in that. There was a lot of rubbing out and pencil drawing. And uh, a couple year ago, year ago, Jen wanted uh, this kind of hand-drawn look for something that the Scientific American was going to do about Einstein. And I think it was probably for kind of the same reason, <laughs> which was that... Um, there was, a, there was a desire not to be too precise with things, that it should have a friendly feel. Also, that people had seen black holes and so on drawn in a particular way, and that I think they wanted to perhaps get away from that um, a little bit. And I realized that I think it is important sometimes that uh, explanations are better uh, if they are slightly imprecise. And... I think that people in the data visualization field, which I know you may be attached to, are really struggling with this at the moment after the uh, misreading of some of the polls uh, f from the recent election. Misreading, not on their part, but by the public, and they haven't, they didn't quite make it clear. Uh, but anyway, I did uh, a series of uh, dr drawings for uh, for Jen, which were kind of lightweight and, uh, uh, you know, they had a certain look to them that was different for Scientific American. And I sent Jen this idea, you know, and, and I realized, oh my God, you know, I can't, I just can't get away from, from uh, Rodin. Now, because of... Uh, New York Times uh, design issue last week. I, I wasn't going to do this, but I thought that maybe I sh I'd show you something that I had done. They did a piece, if you read the re New York Times and saw the magazine, about redesigning the thing that you get with your prescription drugs. And I'd done this uh, some, some time ago with Richard Saul Werman when we were working for uh, CVS. Uh, this is what the Times did, uh, and it, it's, it's okay. Anybody, is anybody here do this? Just, I'm not going to offend you if you are. Yes? And, and, and gave you more information. Uh, this, I think, failed on a few... Uh, thank you, by the way. I actually, what I meant was, if, if anybody from the New York Times was here, you know, I would <laughs> not want to offend them. Um, uh, but since, you want, since there's nobody here, I will offend. Um, the, uh, these are very difficult to read. The, the, I mean, it's, it's slightly blown out as a slide, and probably my scan of the page, too. But um, it, it's okay, and it's a step in the right direction. Yeah? It's a step in the right direction. Uh, this was what we were faced with from uh, CS, CVS Pharmacy. And I think what was missing from the, the piece that, we, that I just showed you was I'm not sure that those designers actually talked to people who are in pharmacies and the restrictions that there are about what you put on this uh, document. Uh, and so what, what we did was to, this is, the, this is before and after, this was in 2008. And one of the most important things, I think, is that uh, the prescription person knows your doctor. So put the doctor's number right there on that prescription, as well as how often you take it, when you should refill, they know when you should refill, and you come to CVS. I mean, it's an ad for them as well, I admit that. 
and we knew we were going down a difficult path when we, when we took this on. But what your thing looks like, your medication in the red box there, um, how, much you, how much it was and how much you pay. So everything is there. Um, and then on the other side of this was, this was high blood pressure uh, medication. So since you see my name up there, that's what I take every day. Um, and, and this is uh, about that. Now, we realized, as probably uh, the uh, designers of the New York Times thing, is that these are thrown away. As soon as you get it, you throw it away, because it's the bottle that matters. So you've got to put something on the bottle. So these, these are not prescription drugs, but we started to work with them before they fired us. Um, uh, and uh, I think because there was a change at the top, actually. I don't think they really fired us. Um, so we, we did work on the aspirin and allergy relief things, which had the stuff printed on it. And on the back of that was, and believe it or not, type in about two-point size, because they said, we have to print this. And we said, but nobody reads it even at six point. And they said, well, so what's the smallest type you can put on there? I mean, I'm serious. It's amazing. You have to put it on. And when we left, they were just buying a chain of uh, pharmacy stores in Florida. And so it would also have to be in Spanish. So I guess one point type was about to be launched. Um, so something that kind of has tied these together, except for that last one, is the idea of making comments, adding a level of commentary to the diagram that explains something but isn't quite part of it. And I've done this quite a bit. Um, this was for uh, attache magazine, in-flight magazine, about how car engines work. There's a little couple here, and the woman is saying, it's so simple. And the engineer is saying, well, I have left some stuff out. Which is a very mild kind of statement, but it just lets people who might look at it and say, well, there's more to than this. I mean, it, it's kind of... It's a little self-conscious, but it's, it's letting you know, oh, you're dropping out some slides. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go with this. Uh, this is about metabolism. And uh, the little person here, who is M for metabolism, th that's a blow up of what he's saying up there, is he's explaining what the diagram is doing. And at the end, there's a kind of throwaway joke because there's a slightly fat person and he should pay attention to this part of, of the metabolistic uh, sequence. Or um, how you hear. This is, these are all for the same magazine. Uh, so it's a, a you know, relatively straightforward diagram of the, of the ear, ears and the bones in the ear. But these little guys here are saying, are talking about the wave form, which is, I think, an interesting thing. You know, it's waves that go up and down like that are, are a high note. I mean, I, I, even at this level, I'm simplifying it, of course. But, and then the one that the guy, guy in the front says, okay, let's go in. So it's a way of making things friendly. This is for an airline magazine where people are sitting in their, in their chair, annoyed because the chair's too small, They've got this thing here. They just want the plane to take off. And uh, so there's very little attention span here. And there's a, there's a series called How It Works. And uh, I worked with um, a great writer. And he, uh, he would send it to me in advance. And we, I would do things that would stand alone from, from, the, from the text. They complemented it rather than from his text. Um, and uh, so. Uh, but annotations like this, or the, the Greek chorus, can actually just be things down the side. This is what I showed you earlier, the thing for Stanford Magazine. It isn't the way it finally appeared. What I originally had here was little descriptions of what this is. B 
because unlike you, scientists and science designers and illustrators and visual artists, the people who read this magazine don't know these terms. What's a clone? Why not use adult stem cells? Why not use adult stem cells? And it answers it for you there, that little bit of the... So the Greek chorus, what I'm calling the Greek chorus, the people who are making comments about the thing that you're doing, enables you to have an extra level of uh, commentary and depth into the piece. So the piece can stand by itself, and then these things stand outside it and kind of explain it in, in further detail. So finally, uh, the cheese course, which is always a good way to end a meal, I think. I was asked by a uh, publisher to do a book on anything that I wanted to do, and I really like cheese, so I thought, how to make cheese? Uh, this little hat thing here, that you can just see on, on my face, uh, is what you have to wear when you're making cheese because they're very... Uh, and, and I went and made cheese at Shelburne Farms, which is a, a great place to go, by the way, in uh, uh, Vermont, near, Bur near Burlington. Uh, anyway, this little company asked me to do, to, to do a book about it. So the book goes through the pasture, the cows, the milk, the cheese, a slight detour about how you get holes in Swiss cheese, and uh, a little love story at the end. So the pages looked roughly like this. Uh, and, uh, and then um, the, uh, at the end, there was this, this thing about why I love cheese. And uh, <coughs> there was this rather complicated uh, diagram. And so this was the print version. But for the, this, for the book, what they wanted was to make an e-book version of it as well, which had a little video. And so this little Greek chorus guy here, oh dear, what on earth does that mean? Pointing here, and you know where to click, and I can make, you can make it fill the whole screen. When you were reading this as an e-book, you could click that thing, and, uh, and it would uh, take, take you to a video, which is this video. I love cheese, just love it. And I used to wonder if there was some scientific reason that could explain why. You know, some important sounding excuse I could use to account for my craving. Here's what I found. We all know that cheese is made from milk. It's basically a concentrate of protein called casein and fat. You eat cheese, mmm, yes. It goes down to the stomach. It sloshes around in the juices there, which start to digest it. And in the process, casein is transformed into casomorphin. And that's a chemical cousin of morphine, or opium. The addiction-inducing casomorphin travels up to the brain, which says, this is great stuff. Eat more of it. Well, it's as simple as that. And now I know why I love cheese. I'm addicted to it. That's my son, and a really nice soundtrack, I think, by uh, Walt Graham. So, in the immortal words of Sidney Greenstreet, uh, to Humphrey Bogart in The Maltese Falcon. Here's to plain speaking and clear understanding. And thank you for listening.